This is Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Last week we worked down through Romans chapter 8 verse 11. And we kind of ended with the... Uh, with the, a couple of discussions. One, a discussion uh, of the idea of, of our physical body being resurrected at the time of the second coming. And we kind of worked through that discussion, which is, which is a challenging piece of scripture to understand. And then we began to also have a little bit of discussion uh, on the Holy Spirit. There's only a few places in the New Testament, and this is one of the most prominent ones where we really get a lot of, of direct teaching regarding the Holy Spirit and, and what the Holy Spirit does, which, which I think is sometimes even more challenging for us to, to understand what, what the Holy Spirit actually does in our life. I don't think there is any question whatsoever, no matter where you stand on the issue, that the Holy Spirit dwells in the hearts of Christians. Period, exclamation point, all right? That is, that is an absolute given. The Holy Spirit dwells in the hearts and the lives of Christians. And in fact, the Scripture will tell us, if He is not in you, you do not have Him. <laughs> in fact, not only that, you do not have a relationship with God. So it, it's very important that we, that we kind of ascertain that. And, it, and it's at that point that we kind of begin to go off on some, in some different directions on how people, Christians specifically, would interpret and understand this concept of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And then once you get past that, then it kind of goes off in another direction as to how he affects our lives. Uh, and, you know, I, I've read both sides. And, and in my mind... No harm is done to the scriptures, however you would interpret this first major branch. And let's talk about the first major branch. The first major branch being, how does or does the Holy Spirit physically dwell in our body? All right? Now, if we had a show of hands, we would probably have someone that would say yes, and we would have some that would say no. When I read the commentaries this morning, again, I look, I look at six, and they, they are literally drawn right down the middle. There is a physical indwelling of the Holy Spirit that He resides in us, and then there are others who stand on the side, and listen closely, He stands on the side of the Holy Spirit, uses the word of truth, the New Testament, to influence our lives. Okay? Split completely down the middle. Now that, that is not to say, and I'm going to use, I did a, 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 a class on this a, f a few months back, uh, and, and we're going to kind of look at the conclusions of what, what that class was and, and kind of go through that here in a minute. So really, here's the two things. The Holy Spirit dwells in our lives, physically, in our bodies, or he uses the word of truth to influence us. Once we get past that, then we go into another major branch, kind of regardless of where you're at. The second major branch is this. Is the activity of the Holy Spirit then limited to what is found only in the New Testament, or can it be outside of the scope of that? And that begins another discussion that, that, we, that, we try to, that we try to understand about the Holy Spirit and about, and about how it acts. Again, in the end, I would be of the opinion that kind of wherever you stand on all of these things, you could probably support in a number of scriptures. And you could probably find good conclusions for, for where you stand. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't feel like there is a right or wrong answer in this particular matter. So, let's kind of stop and, and back up here a little bit, and let me go through some of these conclusions that I drew. Because I think it's important, I, I want you to know where I stand on this. Uh, and, and you will not all agree. You will not all agree. In, in fact, b before, when I started this study, and it was, it was three or four years ago, uh, before I started this, this study, I was completely on the other side of the fence from where I ended up. 
completely on the other side of the fence. And then over the course of my studies, I, I, kind, of, I kind of changed a little bit. Uh, and that's not to say I won't change back <laughs> at some point. I would argue that this is the, probably the single most difficult concept for us to understand. And why is it so difficult? It's difficult because we are physical, carnal, mortal creatures. This body has an end. The spirit is different. It's also different from the fact that we exist in the scope of, of time. Everything that we have is either behind us or in front of us. God exists over time, which is different the way he thinks about time. So all of these things are going to come into, come into play here. So when I did my lesson, and keep in mind this is about a 60 slide, a 60 slide presentation we spent about two or three weeks on it going through it these are these are the conclusions that I reached based on my study okay wait a minute I may not have gone far enough I did not hang on just one moment okay these are the conclusions number one the Holy Spirit dwells in the hearts of Christians today Period. I mean, we're, we're going to read two scriptures here that are, that are going to clearly, I mean, they could not more clearly say that. He dwells in you, okay? Regardless of whether you interpret this as a physical, spiritual indwelling, or through the Spirit using the word of truth as an instrument to accomplish the indwelling, the principle should be clear and without confusion. The Holy Spirit dwells in us. If we do not have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, we do not have God, period, okay? This is where the first major branch takes off. One school of thought is that the word of truth, the gospel, is the instrument by which the Holy Spirit exercises his influence on the Christian. One receives the word of truth into his heart and allows it to motivate his life. To this extent, he is influenced by the Holy Spirit and enjoys, and this is the important part, and enjoys his abiding presence, i.e., the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Now, the physical one is pretty straightforward. There is something about the Holy Spirit that is physically in this, in this temple, the temple of God, the body. This one's a little bit different. Okay? This is important. The previous statement is not to be interpreted as, the meaning, of the Holy, as meaning the Holy Spirit is the word of truth. You see that? I'm not saying that this is the Holy Spirit. You with me? I'm saying it's an instrument by which the Holy Spirit uses to influence our lives. So I guess the question kind of becomes, is it, is it literally and physically? Or is it representatively? Okay, that's, that's kind of the discussion that we've got at this point. And it, it is, it's, a, it's a challenging one, isn't it? It's a challenging one. Where, where, we, where we kind of line up on this... Uh, Scripture tells us clearly that God dwells in us. Scripture tells us clearly that Christ dwells in us. But we are all very accepting of the fact, well, they dwell in us representatively through the Holy Spirit. Right? Is that, would that be a, a correct assumption? God and Jesus both dwell in us through His Word, through the Word of Jesus, and representatively through the Holy Spirit. The question would be is... Does the Holy Spirit then dwell in us representatively through the word of truth? That's, that's the hard leap to make. Now, I will tell you that that is where I stand on this matter. Not physically, but representatively through the word of truth. And I would ask you this. If you became a Christian today and were baptized and received the gift of the Holy Spirit, and you never heard nor read for the rest of your life the gospel, the truth, the word of God. Would you remain a Christian? Could you grow? Could you mature? Could you, could you become what God expects us to be? Could you do these things that all through Romans are being, we're being taught to try to mature, to understand? I don't know. I, 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 that would be those who argue that the Holy Spirit dwells in us physically gives us some kind of innate ability to understand beyond the Scripture. One side of it. Hard question, isn't it? Let's continue on. Let's continue on. 
and this is this is probably the one that I think becomes even more challenging for us because this is this is one where the the water really gets muddy. The influence of the Holy Spirit is limited to the contents of the word of truth, the gospel. What the New Testament says, these are what the New Testament does for us. And there's like 12 or 15 different things that, that he does for us. The influence of the Holy Spirit is limited to the contents of the word of truth which he inspired. This was the purpose of the perfect. Turn to, turn to 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter. Very familiar chapter. Uh, most of us refer to it as the chapter of love, right? First Corinthians, the 13th chapter, and then turn to verses 8. Love never fails. But if there are gifts of property, prophecy, they will be done away with. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But, but this is the important part of that passage that I want us to appreciate. But when the perfect comes... When the perfect comes, the partial will be done away with. Now, the argument here at this point would, would be one of two things. What is the perfect? Is the perfect the gift that we receive at the time of our baptism, the Holy Spirit? Or is the perfect the completed canon of the New Testament? That becomes, that becomes the discussion. That becomes the challenging thing for us to really try to interpret. I argue, in, in, when I read this, that the perfect that's being referenced here is the New Testament. And it is this perfect that abides in our lives through the influence of the Holy Spirit that gives us direction from God. Let's continue on. There's a couple more of these. All we need to know about how to live the Christian life is set forth in the New Testament which was inspired by the Holy Spirit, by this instruction the Holy Spirit leads and guides us in the right way. Number six. The spirits assert, and we mentioned this earlier, the spirits assert that with equal clarity that God, the Father, and Christ, the Son, also dwell in us. But again, it's very easy for us to, to, to make that leap. God dwells in us through the Holy Spirit. Jesus dwells in us through His Word and the Holy Spirit. Number seven. The Holy Spirit strengthens us by means of the Word of Truth, the gospel, which he inspired. And we're going to talk about this. The Holy Spirit, well, we've already, we talked about this last week. The Holy Spirit will raise us up by means of the words of Christ. All who are in the tomb shall hear his voice and will come forth. Here too, that's in, that's in John. We talked about that also in, in Romans. Here too, the Holy Spirit will act by means of the words of, by the words of Christ. Okay. That's where I stand. It, is, it, is, it would be my contention. <laughs> Boy, don't throw anything. That the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is not something physical, but rather that it is the Holy Spirit influencing my life by the means of the Holy Scriptures. Okay? And that is not, the, like I say, I would say that is not traditional, but really when you read, when you read commentaries, learned people of, of, the, of the Bible who spent their whole life trying to understand these things, they split right down the middle. Physical, representative. Thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that's the problem when you have, you say it's one or the other. Okay. And it is a physical indwelling is an oxymoron. The spirit is not physical. Right. The spirit is the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, you have to remember, is part of the Godhead. The Holy Spirit is just not a concept. We learn from reading the Word. The Word is the sort of the Spirit. The Spirit delivered the Word. Deliver the Word. So, uh, and when you look at the Spirit described as the Spirit of truth, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, a gift from God, part of the Godhead, uh -huh. to be our helper, our comforter, our advocate. The work of the Spirit involves our prayers to God. Yeah, we're going to talk about that today. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, to, to say someone in the first century that just heard that uh, had no assistance in their prayer to God, I think is missing the point. Yeah. And when we try to divide, it's either one or the other. 
think that's where we're getting off track. Okay. Raymond would kind of argue then it's both. It's both. <coughs> right? It certainly helped. The, the Spirit is, uh, our prayers should be that the Spirit helps lead us, help us to grow and understand the nature of God and Christ, and uh, grow closer to God, become more Christ like. Now, some, some would say there are still miraculous gifts of the Spirit. Yeah. Which I think 1 Corinthians 13 well shuts down. Yes, I, I think that clarifies it. serves as our seal, our guarantee of our salvation. And yes, a lot of that we learn and understand through the Word, but the Word doesn't control the Spirit. The Spirit, the, the Word is the sword of the Spirit. Okay. In that, uh, in that description, putting on the whole armor of God, where it talks about the Word being the sword of the Spirit, it goes on and says, our prayers must be in the Spirit. Yeah. So it's not limited to the Word. The okay. Word is a tool of the Spirit. Okay. Who else? <clears throat> I would encourage you, <clears throat> go through this exercise of trying to sit down and articulate what you think the spirit is. <laughs> it is it is a challenging endeavor. Uh, yeah, no, go keep it. Best resource I've read on it is a publication called Poured Out. Call what? Poured, poured out? out? Okay. Poured out the God poured out the spirit. And that's if you read reviews on that, this was uh, there was a review in the Christian Chronicle. And it has been acclaimed the most complete work on the Holy Spirit by an author of the Church of Christ. Okay. Poured Out I, is the I, name I, of that piece of that documentation. Poured Out. Excellent. Does the Holy Spirit <clears throat> say a young person working them before they become a Christian? Now say that again. Does the Holy Spirit work in a young person, say, before they become a Or anybody before they become a Christian? I would argue no. Uh, now, I would argue that the, the Word itself, which John told us Jesus is the Word, is what works in their lives, but not the Spirit. The Spirit is our gift that we received at the time of our belief and our baptism. That would be my argument. I don't know where you stand on that. that you can't be saved until you get the Holy yes, yes. I don't know where they could find support in Scripture for that concept. Uh, that the Spirit, uh, Dub's question is, is, is the idea that the Spirit comes into us and moves us toward God or moves us toward acceptance. And I, I don't see support for that in Scripture, but that, that was a denominational view. That's a tough, that's a tough subject. It, it, is, it is difficult to understand. And I, I hope each of us will give that, give that thought and consideration. I like that. I'm going I'm to get that book and, and read and, that. And, and one of the dangers of saying, well, the Holy Spirit is limited by what you can understand in the Word. I, I remember doing a class on prayer right here in this room. It had been some two or three years ago. And uh, short of time, so I just asked, how many believe you've had a prayer answer? Guess how many raised their hand? I don't know. Almost everybody. Okay. If you're saying that the Holy Spirit doesn't help us, uh, then what's the purpose? Uh, I, I mean, Alexander Campbell's position that it's only through the written word says, in effect, and, and this is his article, said that if you think you've had a prayer answered by some means other than circumstance, and you're mistaken because God doesn't work that way any longer. The Holy Spirit is simply what you understand from the Word. Don't expect in your prayers any intervention. I, I would agree with that. Uh, the thought there being... And if that's true, what's the purpose? Yeah, now, but again, my argument would still be, and, and there, are, there, there, there are about 11 or 12 different items that the scripture specifically said, and one of them certainly is prayer. And, and we're going to talk about that again today. We're going to, it's the idea that at some level, 
our ability to communicate or, or our language is insufficient in expressing our emotions to God. And through that, the Holy Spirit then intercedes for us and appeals to God of the things that we can't express. Is that, would that make sense to you? That we can't even express because of the limitations of our ability to communicate. So, it, Not to quench the spirit. Yeah. And too many times they take the position that one or the other. It's only this. All right. Romans chapter eight, verse twelve. So then, brethren. Kind of a kind of a summary of what he's just been talking about. So then, brethren, we are oblig in, we are under obligation not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. And I think 13 is the, is the important piece here in this particular one. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. Do that? Spiritually and eternally. If you live according to the flesh, you must die. But if, the, but if by the Spirit you are put on, putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. I want, I want you to listen to this uh, a quote here that I got from from a guy by the name of David Lipscomb. And this is what he said about that verse, and it really, it really spoke to me. He said, This is so because Christians lose spiritual life in proportion as they indulge the appetites and desires of the flesh that are contrary to the teachings of the Lord. Listen to that again. This is so because Christians lose spiritual life in proportion as they indulge the appetites and desires of the flesh that are contrary to the teaching of the Lord. If, for example, a Christian indulges in anger or malice or any of the passions that the Lord condemns, he is not only violating the Lord, but he is destroying the spiritual man and weakening it every day and giving the flesh greater and greater power over the spirit. So the flesh will dominate and control the whole man while the spiritual man languishes and dies. His argument is, as we allow the emotions which, which God and Christ have condemned to become more and more a part of our life, it slowly kills the spiritual side of our life to the point where that spiritual side will languish and die and the flesh will resurrect Remember, there? Remember we talked a couple chapters ago. Old man, baptism, new man. That new man doesn't mean that that's the way we're going to be forever. We must continue to change and be more. Paul here is saying, if we indulge those fleshly things, we revert back to the old man, which is death, eternally and spiritually. Very interesting piece of passage. Powerful, powerful piece of passage. 14. He continues on. For all who are being led by the Spirit, and, and this goes back to verse 11. We're in the middle. He said, the Spirit of Him who, Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead and dwells into you, dwells in you. And in verse 9 where he says, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, those ideas, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, we come back down. For all those who are being led by the Spirit of God, listen to this, these are the sons of God. That's how we know that we are of God, that we have the Spirit in us. All right, continue on. For you, and, and again, who is Paul talking to? That, that's always important that we remember. Paul is talking to Christians in Rome, not the church in, 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 as, a, as a corporate entity, but Christians, individual Christians in Rome, because he hasn't been there Okay, he's writing this letter in anticipation of going there, kind of priming the pump, getting more anxious and getting them excited about him coming. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. Now, Abba is, it means Father, so it's just like saying Father, Father. He's contrasting, I, I think, the law of bondage, the, the old law here, and, and that's been a, a continual theme throughout Romans, this, this idea of the old law being, being gone. For you have not received a spirit of slavery, an old law, which you, can't, which you can't fulfill, leading to fear again, but have received a spirit of adoption 
by as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. Let's continue on. Verse 16. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. Now, boy, that's a point blank one, isn't it? So is there interaction at some level between our spirit and the spirit of God? Absolutely there are. I mean, it couldn't say it more clearly. The spirit, which we have been given as a gift, himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs of Christ, if, I think that's a key word, if, conditional, if indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. I love this idea that, that Paul explores here and he does it in other places of, of us as the adopted children of God. Right? Everything I have in, in my estate, all right? <laughs> very limited, <laughs> everything I own at some point when Pam and I are gone, will will go to my children. It will be their it will be their possession. Whether they're whether they are our physical children or whether they are adopted children. But they don't get that until I die, do they? Right? That's that's kind of the idea here that that if we remain faithful, if we continue to dwell in the Spirit, if we continue to be the sons of God, if we pretend to be the brother of Christ, this is our promise. You see, you see how he's, he, he's kind of binding that around? If we stay faithful, we get what Christ has where he's at now. Let's read that from that perspective and listen to that from that perspective. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs of Christ, listen to this, if indeed we suffer with Him so that we may also be glorified with Him. What is suffering with Him? Living the life that we're living. Living the Christian life. Remaining faithful, remaining obedient, doing the things that God has prescribed. That's, that's the essence of this verse. We are just like Christ in our expectation, our hope, which he's going to talk about hope more in a little while, but our hope being more than just a wish, being a, an, an expectation that we will receive if we remain faithful. Continue on. Verse 18. For I consider the sufferings of this present time, and I think I think it's probably hard for us to uh, to adequately compare our lives to Paul in a <laughs> shipwreck, beaten, all, all the things he endured for 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 the cause. But we still have we still have things that we do as Christians that are that we sacrifice things that would be probably more pleasurable for an, a relationship with God. And that's the idea. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. How good will heaven be? How good will salvation be? How good will it be to hear God look down and say, well done? Have you ever thought about that? Have you, can you just imagine... The eternal relief, the, the eternal, I, I don't, we, we just don't have the words to say, what will it be like when God says, well done, enter in. That's, and that's, I think that's what Paul is trying to, to, to articulate here. For I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to you. Verse 19, yeah, Brother Raymond. No. Uh, I remember uh, Justin Martin in his defense if he explained uh, the, how the Church of Christ and, but would not honor Caesar would not bow down to Caesar and I think one of his comments was you know I, I'm happy to suffer uh, for 
Bible and something along those lines because he knew he was going to be brutally tortured and killed. And so many of those martyrs uh, carried that same attitude. It was an honor to yeah. be tortured by the Romans, burned alive, uh, tossed to the wild beasts. Some of that stuff, if you read the history, it just makes you sick. Yeah, unfathomable. The they went through. You know, tradition, tradition tells us that Peter, when he was going to be crucified, uh, requested to be crucified upside down so that he did not feel like he was worthy to be crucified even in the manner that his, his Savior was crucified. Tradition. But yeah, just, just a beautiful piece of passage. Let's continue on. Okay, let me, let me talk about this. This is another one of those, those, those contexts or those subjects that we're going to, to explore here uh, that has deep division. In the same way I, I fell on the earlier subject of where we stand on the Holy Spirit, where you stand on this particular item, I don't think will do harm either way to the Scripture. And it's the subject of the creation. Okay, Paul is going to go through an, an, an kind of an exploration of this this word, the creation. Now, I guess you would say some of the the older commentaries, ones that were written in the the 1800s all stood by the idea that the creation is the world, the trees, the fields, the oceans, the world, and how it was cursed. Remember when, when, when Adam and Eve sinned, the ground was cursed? They, they would stand by the idea that, that, that this, this creation is the world. Some of the more contemporary writers, and that, that is probably those that were done in the last 150 years, have kind of stood by the idea that the creation is more likely mankind. Uh, so, But again, wherever you stand on that, I think you can defend it with adequate scriptures, and it's probably not going to matter, but that's just something to, to talk about. And I'll tell you where I stand now. Let's read the passage. And, and as you read this, I, th I think you, your mind will probably go both ways. You'll say, oh, that's clearly the creation, the world, earth, and then you'll go back. Okay. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. So where do you stand? <laughs> is it the world or is it mankind? Let me look at a couple passages here real quick just to kind of give you where, where I think. I, I would stand by the idea that it is mankind, okay? And let me show you what. Go to Mark 16, 15. Mark 16, 15. Very familiar passage. If I could find it. Mark 16, 15. This is Jesus talking. And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. So is he talking about trees and bushes and ocean? Or is he talking about mankind? Now go over to, or go over to uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 23. By the way, that is, at least in Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Uh, that is uh, the exact same word that Paul used in all of those writings. Colossians chapter 1, verse 23. Paul writes this, If indeed you continue in the faith, firmly established and steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel you have heard, listen to this, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven. Mankind or the world? I, you could argue it either way. You could argue it either way. So let's go back to our passage and again, in my mind, wherever you stand on that particular word, and because he's going to use it continually now down through this next few verses, it does no harm to the scriptures. I think either, either could be defended. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility. I would, in my mind, I would interpret that in saying, for the creation, all of mankind was subjected to the influence of sin. Make sense? That, that would be the way that I would look at that. For the creation was subject to, to futility. Not willingly. We did not willingly, and he's been exploring this for a long, long time, this idea that sin is not something that, even Paul himself in the last chapter said, this is not something I want to do, but I still find myself doing it. Not willingly, but because of him who subjected it 
in hope to see Christ is the idea. That the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Now, this is a passage that, that clearly puts me on the side of creation being mankind. Uh, just, from, just, from that, just from that particular description. And then, then I go back. <laughs> Next verse, verse 22. He says, For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth until now. However, I would, my interpretation of that would be the whole creation being mankind groans and suffers because of the law and our inadequacy to complete it until now the coming of Jesus. Does that make sense? That, that would be how I would look at that particular verse. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth during the time when the law was in place. We could not meet it. We were, we were lost. We had no hope. because we had no, Let me rephrase that. We had no forgiveness at that point. Okay? So, groans and suffers the pains of childbirth until now. And until now is the hope that comes through Christ. And not only this, but we also find ourselves having the first fruits of the Spirit, even ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. And that goes back to that piece of Scripture back in verse uh, uh, 16 and 17 about the, the adoption, the, the heirs, the, the adoption side. We wait eagerly for that adoption. And, and, that, and that again, I think it's important for us to appreciate what we always look for are conditional statements. Things that our salvation hinges upon. Conditional statements. And, and I think this is one. Waiting eagerly for our adoptions as son, the redemption of the body. Two more verses and then we'll call it a week. For in hope, this is what I talked about earlier about hope. For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is not seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, the perseverance we wait eagerly, with perseverance we wait eagerly for it. This hope that he's talking about here, in my mind, it's not just a, a rote wish. Or something that we dream about, something that we that we are, are are somewhat skeptical or doubtful that we may receive. The hope that he's talking about here is, in my mind, the great confidence that we have, the great expectation that we have for redemption, for salvation, for heaven. You see that? And, he, and he's saying, but if we could see it, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be hope. This is something that we that we that we seek, that we grow for, that we mature to. And through perseverance, faithfulness, obedient faithfulness, we receive it. You see that? Let's read it one more time from that perspective. For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. We, we can't see heaven yet. We can't see the the reward. But hope that is not seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he already sees? And then he answers it. But if we hope for what we do not see, that is faith, obedient faith. If we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance, we wait eagerly for it. Wow. It's good stuff, isn't it? <laughs> it ain't easy. <laughs> Any thoughts as we wrap up? We would call these free shots. <laughs> Let's close with a prayer. Our merciful God, we are so thankful for Your Word. It has given us inspiration and teaching. We're so thankful for Your Spirit, Father. It dwells in us. And it gives us a glimpse of what we know to be our God. And we're so thankful for our Savior who is the Word, who came and dwelt amongst us 
And for all these things, our God, we have hope. And Paul tells us here that through perseverance, that hope will become salvation. Forgive us when we fail you. Love us always. Give each of us the necessary discipline to study, to learn more, to understand more fully. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.